Dynamic violence. Savvy Jackson. Spectacular thrill. You may wish to deny it, but your eyes tell you it's true. It's a lie. So imagine you were with the crew of a Japanese fishing boat in 1954. It was just like another day and they were sailing in the North Pacific Ocean. The boat was called the Lucky Dragon, but that day it was not that lucky. The ocean was unusually rough and that led the crew to change their course to an atoll near the Marshall Islands called Bikini. Coincidentally, Bikini Atoll also happened to be the testing site for the American hydrogen bomb test codenamed Castle Bravo. The bomb was set to go on exactly that day. However, the US government was careful enough to announce a pre-calculated danger zone around the test area. The boat was outside that zone and they continued to carry out their work. A massive orange fireball emerged from the ocean reaching the heights no one has ever seen before. It only took a couple of seconds for everyone to realize that the calculations were dead wrong. The so-called danger zone was made expecting a power release of about 5 megatons from the explosion but it ended up releasing more than 15. That's 1000 times more powerful than the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. In a few seconds, the boat and the crew was exposed to extreme amount of radiation from the nuclear fallout, severely injuring everyone. But it also did something unexpected. The power of the bomb was so destructive, it ended up disturbing the environment around the deep sea floor. It awakened a savage creature with absolute eagerness for destruction that had the power of a nuclear arsenal. The folklore called it Godzilla. That's the premise of the 1954 movie Godzilla, directed by the veteran director Shiro Honda. And even though it's a movie, everything in the premise, except for a monster being awakened, is true to life. That explosion was real and people got hurt. It's a very personal story for Japan and it's the most recent event that inspired the movie to be like a protest of all the nuclear tests and activity that was happening at the time. But we know that story. What's a bit weird? is that even though the original movie was a massive hit in Japan and even considered a global cinematic classic today, the rest of the world won't see or even know that this movie exists for nearly half a decade. The studio that made Godzilla, the Toho Corporation, would make 26 more Godzilla sequels because of the success of the original film and most of them were released outside Japan. But they just will not do it for the original until 2004, almost 50 years later. Even that is because a bunch of bootleg versions of the movie flooded the market, which is technically illegal, but we had the original director of the movie on record saying that he's actually thankful for that. Quote, I'm happy to hear that they did up these things. This raised a big concern amongst the public. Did Toho intentionally try to shelf the movie? I mean, this film is not just some monster movie. It's a cultural landmark. It's the starting point of the longest running movie franchise in history with some of the best spectacle and stories. This video is not about Godzilla or his impact on our culture, but really it's about the odd journey the original movie had to take become such a hit in American cinema and by an extent in the world. Godzilla was a gamble for Toho. They pumped 100 million yen into an unproven concept, but in the end, it ended up doing way better than they expected. Godzilla became the 8th highest grossing movie in Japan that year and made 183 million yen in the box office. Now, at this point, Toho had done well for themselves, right? They were a seasoned studio that had made a bunch of critically and commercially successful films, but almost all of them were just in Japan. 
So Toho felt like it's time that they want to send their films to other countries like the US and Canada. So in 1953, they have started a subsidiary in Los Angeles called Toho International to do just that. So the easiest way to show a movie in another country is simply to just sell the rights of the movie to someone called a distributor. And that's what they did. So they transferred the rights of Godzilla to Toho International. And in this case, the distributor was a man called Edmund Goldman. Goldman was not fully convinced that this movie would work with American audiences. Like he thought it was just too furry, but he liked it enough to buy the rights for 25 grand. And in retrospect, that's a pretty big bargain. This is an extract of the agreement they came up with. As part of the deal, Goldman received the rights of the movie for five years with the soundtrack, the sound mix, the effects track, and the most important one, the right to narrate, dub, and add and delete scenes. Remember this detail, it will come back later. So Godzilla is with Goldman. But his lack of experience with a movie like this came into play and simply he didn't know what to do with it. So he had to get help from two of his friends, Harold Ross and Richard K. By the way, if you see an asterisk in a photo, it means they are AI generated because I couldn't find like a real life photo of them. Um, sorry about that. So Harold and K had made some films before and they immediately knew the potential of Godzilla and what they can do with the rights. They are the one who came up with the idea to dub the film without subtitles. Goldman was very impressed with the ideas and he later would resell the rights to them for an undisclosed amount. After that, Harold and Kay pitched the movie again to a producer called Joseph Louis to get help financing the movie and he agreed to give them $100,000 to be 50-50 partners and that money got them working. While Harold and Kay would focus on the production side of things, Levine would bring another partner in to focus more on the business side of things. And in 1956, the movie is done and it will be released as Godzilla, King of the Monsters. It's alive. It was a massive success for the creators. The movie would make over $2 million just in the US and even more when it will be released in other countries. People liked it and this release made Godzilla a household name around the world. And yet, there was just this one problem. The movie was kind of different. Like, it's almost like they showed the wrong film. The agreement that Toho gave allowed the movie to be dubbed in English, right? And surely, some of the Japanese dialogue was dubbed. And judging from this photograph, this creature is over 400 feet tall. Poorly, but dubbed but most of it wasn't even touched and usually they got explained twice by this guy or just weirdly left out. It looks like the team was more focused on the last clause of the agreement, the right to make additions and deletions. In this version of the movie, Harold and Kay had ditched the main viewpoint from the original Japanese characters to an American protagonist who was just visiting Japan, played by the Canadian actor Raymond Burr. Most of the character development scenes were just gone to be replaced by Raymond Burr and his voiceover and when he had to interact with the original characters, he would just talk to body doubles that barely resembled the actual people. Fun fact, all the scenes with Burr were shot just in 24 hours because they just wanted to get it done quickly as possible. I mean, you can kind of see it because most of his scenes are just him staring, staring behind someone's back, staring behind a crowd, staring behind a window, and making phone calls, like a lot of phone calls. In the original, Godzilla's origin was closely tied to nuclear bomb tests and even though this version kept that point, it was shortened just to a single scene. But even with these changes, Toho liked this version so much because it made a bunch of money, they decided to release it in Japan. This was one of the most weirdest decisions from Toho and this is when we get to know that selling the rights of the movie in the first place was not at all a decision from the creative team but purely just a corporate one. And even the original director was clueless about it right until this point. Toho even advertised this version 
as 100 times more interesting than the original. Even though it's the same movie, but worse. For decades, the American version was the definitive Godzilla movie. And people liked it because they didn't know that it's not the real deal. Because Toho just would not release it outside Japan. And we still don't know why. But something changed in 1992. A huge Godzilla fan in Boston somehow found a copy of the original film and he liked it so much he subtitled the movie himself and released it as a bootleg version meaning it's not official and technically illegal and shortly after multiple bootleg versions were sold in local video stores and this like spiral effect slowly went mainstream and got the attention of the public from epic monster showdowns to mysterious hidden worlds we all know the larger than life characters that are godzilla the fans that had no idea about this movie that were fans of the american version all started admiring this version better in director Ishii Honda's final interview, he was actually thankful that people now can finally see his original vision for Godzilla even after waiting for so long. He even joked about how it might even be illegal. So all of this just increased the pressure for Toho to release the movie in the US officially. And they would finally do it in 2004, exactly on the film's 50th anniversary. Even to this day, nobody really know the exact reason why Toho didn't release the film for 50 years. I mean, it's definitely not the contract because it was just only valid for 5 years. So like, far as we know, there is really nothing stopping them. But one thing is pretty clear. They do regret not doing so. They kind of hint about this in the YouTube description for the trailer of the movie. And I tried to contact them to ask what really happened, but they didn't get back. 